But let's talk about what what it was like in prison, because not, mm. not everybody like you has been to prison. And um, I have to imagine it wasn't glamorous. It was it was a, it was federal prison, right? Because it's federal crimes in Colorado. So did you have a roommate? What were the inmates like to you? Well, I'm the only governor on a lot of stuff, including the only one to be put in a higher security prison. So my first 32 months, I was in what the inmates call the prison behind the razor wire. That's the barbed wire fence. Mm -hmm. And you can't go near that fence because if you do, there are prison guards there armed with machine guns who have the discretion to shoot you. Mm -hmm. And there were about 950 guys there. There were all kinds of drug dealers, cartel members, gang bangers, Sureños, Norteños, Crips and Bloods, uh, Aryan Nation, racist white guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Pacific Islander gangs, Native American gangs. And, and the gangs are important because... They, they encourage segregation of the groups of people. They want to keep them separate within that kind of prison world. Um, there were murderers there, bank robbers, con artists. Of the 950 guys, maybe there was about 2%, me being one of them, that were so-called white collar. You know, in other words, business crimes or things of that sort. Of course, I'm the only governor there. Um, and my home for that time, for a lot of that time, was a little cell, six foot by eight foot prison cell four cement walls, a big, heavy iron door that can shut you in, small window with bars on it, a bunk bed uh, for two. Well, I'm on the top and the other guy, and the, the, the in, inmates would come and go, so you'd have different roommates, bunk cellies, they call them. Um, so you're, I was on the top, the other guy was on the bottom, a little space. Sometimes they lock you in and you'd be in there for a couple of days. You do push-ups in there. Um, so, you know, it was real prison, like in the movies. And then after 32 months, because I was well-behaved model inmate. Um, then I was able to get transferred to the camp and the camp is still prison. You're away from your family, but there, there aren't any fences. You're on your own. You can't leave the boundary. And the, there's, a, there's more free time that you're not as monitored like you are in that higher prison because they're always keeping an eye on everybody. And uh, you're, you're with a different type of, the community's different. It's a, it's a less threatening or violent type community in the camp. But that first 32 months was uh, where I started. And uh, I didn't fear anybody. You know, I grew up in a rough and tough neighborhood. And, and you know, what, after they well, did what they did to me. There's rough and tough, and then there's prison. Yeah. But, yes. and But after what they did to me and the, all the different feelings I had, I, I, I feared nothing. And if somebody wanted to hurt me, in some ways, it was almost a relief. Mm. You know, you can, Interesting. if you know what I'm saying, it'd be yeah. sort of like, yeah. get you out of your misery. Because... To me, of course, the hardest part was the yearning for home and missing your children, and your wife, the hole in your heart that you're walking around with always. And it never goes away. Over time, it, it blunts. And over, as the years unfolded, I mean, it would be weeks, then months, then seasons, then years and years mm. and years. That hole in your heart and that, that pain that you feel deep inside that's always with you, it's a constant companion, it blunts. But then it would get triggered. You'd be around a bunch of guys. Somebody might say something that's funny. You'd laugh. And then you'd remember something, maybe about your children or your wife or home or something. And then that sadness would come in and it would remind you where you are and where you've been for a long time. Thank so you. it's not an easy thing. Of course not. But in here again, way, I had- In a, in a had, way, Rod, it's like, you know, you, you were mentioning my dad and, and I wouldn't mm -hmm. recommend the loss of someone that close to you at, you know, the tender age of 15 to yeah. anyone. But- yeah. When you lose somebody to death, you know they're gone. You know, you're, you have to go mm -hmm. forward and you think of those memories and you're sad that the person's no longer there to share them with you. But in a way, this seems almost harder because the people are still here and they're just going on without you. All these great new memories are happening. You just can't have any access to them. You're just excluded and you'll never be able to go back and get access to them again. I mean, I'm not trying to bum you out. I'm just thinking yeah. about the torture that must be. Well, yes, but as you write in your book and you talk about embracing adversity, I, I, I know you, did, you say that because I saw you say it on TV and I know what your book's about. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to do. And so my mission, my purpose was to lead by example and teach my daughters hard lessons now by living it. So as I said, you, you can catch up on your reading. I read a great book three times in those 2,896 days called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And in that book, he says that the last human freedom is our freedom to choose our own attitude in any given set of circumstances. Mm. And my, my purpose after I left the real world and crossed into that threshold, which was now prison 
in that tiny little world that I was now in with all those gangbangers, and some of the murderers and criminals and all the other guys, the bank robbers and the rest. My purpose was to be as strong as I possibly can be, to use that time in the most constructive way that I can use it to get through the time and to plant the seeds for one day, maybe you can do something good later on in life. But most of all, to teach my daughters by the example that I said during this difficult, hard circumstance, how you face adversity. That's how I convinced myself that I had purpose. Yeah. I think I think that was the right thing to do. And uh, and it gave me inspiration to go on and, and, and be strong because let's face it, it's a long, long time. And you feel like the whole world's come down on you. you. Sometimes hope creeps in, despair creeps in. I mean, hopelessness creeps in, despair creeps in, and you got to push it away. And when I would remind myself of what my purpose was, which is something better than me, my daughters, and the love I have for them and Patty, I had to endure and persevere and eventually overcome. And so it actually gave me strength in a weird oh, way so, when I feel so weakness. So let me, let me ask you an impertinent question, which is, you know, mm -hmm. I'd be less worried about despair creeping in in my little cell than I would about another man. <laughs> like, you mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's got to be a concern, right? So tell me about that. <laughs> you mean some guy kicking your ass or some other? No, I mean, did anybody, anybody ever come for you in a, in a less than threatening and sort of a, hey, gov, love gov <laughs> kind of way? Yes, you're asking a valid question because that very, it, that's very real there, as you know. Well, you don't know that, but it is. I mean, it's, uh, it is a, a fact of life that some of these guys get together and do that thing stuff. There are gay people there and they, they, gravitate to other gay guys and but there are guys gay. who are not gay who then right. do that um i never felt threatened by any of that frankly I, I, I never did i mean there's you're gonna have conflict when you're with men for a long time every day all those years you know i want the window open he wants it closed there'll be conflict you are with men who are mostly criminals i mean there were some others that maybe that didn't do what they were in there for maybe but most of them are criminals and there are a lot of tough guys, as you can imagine. And uh, you're going to have conflict from time to time. But like I said, I mean, after what I had gone through and, and, and feeling the real pain, which is the loss of the heartbreak of being away from my family, I, I never felt any fear or anything that any of those guys can do to me that would cause me anything to worry about. I just, I, I, I never did. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.